This 1763's Burr Beast Uprising. Occurring almost half a century before the Haitian Revolution, this rebellion saw thousands of captive Africans in the Dutch colony of Berbice rising up against the plantocracy. Like many other independent struggles, the conflict led to the creation of a country, the country of Berbice. Though the nation's existence was short-lived, the struggle that bore it inspired Guyana's national independence struggle over two centuries later. This is the story of the 1763 Berbice Uprising. Welcome to another episode of For the Culture Guyana. This month, February 23rd to be exact, Guyana celebrates its 50th anniversary of becoming a republic. In honor of the occasion, we are going to learn about the 1763 Burbies Uprising. Before we get into that, like and share the video and subscribe to our channel for more great content. The Dutch were the first Europeans to establish a permanent colony in present day Guyana. I say permanent because the story of European colonialism in Guyana is a long and messy one as this 83,000 square mile piece of land has changed hands more times than a hundred dollar bill at the Starbrook market. Limited supplies, disease, and harsh environmental conditions mean that the Dutch looked to the forced labor of Captain Africans as a means to survive, but they worked them to death. I mean, I'm, I'm not being dramatic. This is chattel slavery, folks. I mean, literally, the people were worked to death. Being thoroughly fed up with the treatment by this point, an enslaved African named Kofi Badu decided enough was enough. It was clear to him that the Dutch needed to go. He then began amassing an army. And on February 23rd, 1763, he and his army of over 3,800 persons sprang into action. Starting from Plantation Lillianburg on the Kanji River, the army went from plantation to plantation along the river, killing the masters, managers, and just about anyone who represented the cruel plantocracy that kept them in bondage. The news of the uprising sent the colonial governor Wilford Simon Van Hogenheim into full panic mode. He immediately dispatched all of the available military units he could muster, 12 sailors and 12 soldiers. At the time, the entire colony had only 346 whites, including women and children, well over 4,000 Africans, and an unknown number of indigenous persons. Plus, it would seem that apparently the Dutch just assumed that the Africans would just be cool with the whole slavery thing, so clearly they were thoroughly surprised by the rebellion. So obviously then, by this point, the whole colony was literally losing its collective mind. The rebels then moved like an unstoppable force through the region, burning plantations, attacking colonists, freeing Africans, and seizing gunpowder and guns along the way. Their destination, the capital of Berbice, Fort Nassau located 56 miles up the Burbese River. By this point, many of the surviving Dutch colonists fled, seeking refuge in ships docked near Fort Nassau and Fort St. Andrews. In a matter of days, the army had expelled the Dutch from the upper Burbese region. On March 8th, Cuffey sent a letter to Van Hogenheim. Yes, Cuffey knew how to read and write, so you know, you don't be ignorant now. On March 8th, Cuffey sent a letter to Van Hogenheim explaining the reason for the rebellion and encouraged him and his people to leave peacefully. But Cuffey also warned him, if you want beef, you got it. This triggered Van Hogenheim to move his followers to St. Fort Andrews at the mouth of the Burbies River. When he arrived, he began a furious letter writing campaign asking for assistance from nearby Dutch colonies, the Dutch West Indies Company, and basically anyone who would hear his plea. By this time, the colonists were delusional with fear. They wanted nothing but to return to Holland. Van Hogenheim what a fun name to say. Van Hogenheim refused their requests, although he almost agreed to let them go until help arrived on March 27th. The British sent them a ship of 100 soldiers and supplies from Suriname. This was interesting seeing as the British and the Dutch were mortal enemies in the 18th century, but the European consensus was that a free black nation is far too scary to let exist. The belief was that such a thing would actually inspire additional uprising, and uh, I mean, they weren't really wrong on that one though. Anyway, back to Kofi. Seeing that freedom without discipline is chaos, he immediately set about establishing a government based on the Dutch system, with him as its governor and its administration at Hollandia and Zeelandia. 
he appointed several counselors, including Ankara, who was respected as a strict military disciplinarian, and Atta, another military leader, the two of whom would be entrusted with leading Kofi's military while he governed the newborn nation. He also established work gangs to continue food and sugar production on the plantations. To defend the land, blacksmith shops were established to build and repair guns. However, the war effort was severely hampered by a lack of outside sources of gunpowder. However, the process of nation building brought about a serious existential issue. Cuffey realized that in this context, in the 1700s, survival as an independent nation is impossible without trade with the Europeans. But in the mind of the Europeans, the nation's mere existence poses a threat to them. He then began to soften his stance from the total expulsion of the Dutch to the containment of them to the coast. Thus began a several month period of skirmishes and negotiations between the African rebels and the Dutch. In each letter to Van Hogenheim, Kofi called for peace, face-to-face -face negotiations, and recognition from the Dutch government. While Kofi wrote in earnest, Van Hogenheim did not. In each letter, he lied to Kofi, telling him that he was still awaiting a response from Holland regarding their recognition. During this time, the government of the neighboring colony of Demerara used an age-old tactic of divide and conquer. They recruited an army of indigenous men to attack the African rebels from the south. Their progress was slow, but steady. The attacks and subsequent retreats began to demoralize the rebels. Divisions arose among tribal lines. These divisions seriously undermined the military strength of the rebels and gave the Europeans time to regroup. Meanwhile, the differences between Kofi and Atta continued to grow and eventually Atta gathered enough followers to challenge his leadership. Seeing that he was outnumbered and outgunned, Kofi took his own life with a single musket shot. Atta, now the new leader, appointed several new commanders. Unfortunately, several months had passed and reinforcements finally arrived for the colonialists. By December 19, 1763, Dutch soldiers were moving up the Kanji and Burbis rivers, taking back control of the plantations along the way, while the indigenous ambush parties moved in from the south. Many Africans surrendered, while others fled into the forest. Some did fight back, but they were quickly suppressed. Soon after, Atta and his commanders were captured and executed. Between March and April of 1764, 40 African rebels were hanged, 24 were broken at the wheel, and 24 burned to death. Others who were rounded up were re-enslaved. Though the conflict ended violently, the passion for independence did not. The rebellion inspired several other revolts in Ghana and throughout the Caribbean. The movement's leader, Kofi, has been venerated as a national hero of Guyana, honored by a monument at the Square of the Revolution in Georgetown. When Guyana declared itself as a republic in 1970, February 23rd was chosen in honor of Cuffey and his rebellion. And that is a summary of the 1763 Burbies Uprising. A big thank you to the many historians who wrote on this conflict. We'll include some of the sources we used in the description of this video. If you'd like more information about some of the sites we mentioned in this episode, including how to visit them, check the link to our website. If you like this video, hit the like button and let us know what you liked in the comments. Also, I want to give a big thank you to our first patron, Miss Donna Haley. Thanks, Donna. Your contribution shows that you are a true supporter of quality content on Guyanese history. If you're watching it and also would like to support our effort to educate the world on Guyana, you too can become a patron through Patreon. You can show your support with as little as $1 a month. And finally, share For the Culture Guyana's videos with all your friends and family so they too can learn interesting facts about Guyana. Until next week, thanks for watching and do it for the culture.